Here is part number three. We're in a beautiful deception. The whole idea of this series um, is, you know, let's, there, there's a war going on. There is a battle going on, a spiritual battle. And what we kind of do, I think unknowingly, we accidentally do this, and we don't engage in battle. We don't engage in the warfare that exists. Like, it's actually happening, but we're not engaged in it. And so because of that, we're deceived. The wool is pulled over our eyes. We, we try to live like there's not an enemy of our soul who's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And, and so that we, there's things actually being taken from our life, and, and there are some causes and effects that are happening all around us in, in our family, in our personal life, in our future, in our destiny, maybe even with our children and things like that. And, 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 and we can't really put a finger on it. Like, why is this continuing to happen? Well, I believe that there is a battle going on. And, and so what we're doing in this series is, is exposing the lies of the enemy. Because this is MO. The Bible says he's, he's the father of lies. He's been lying from the very beginning. And so what we're doing is we're exposing these lies, the deceptions of, of the enemy. And then we're also telling you how, to, how you can overcome the lies. What weapons God has given you to actually engage in this warfare and stop kind of going through the motion of life, living like everybody else lives that don't know Jesus and acting like you're not in a battle. There is a battle. So, but God has given you very specific weapons to fight and win this war. And check this out. It's already won. Amen. It's already won. Jesus has already paid the ultimate price and assured your victory. So as you even engage in warfare, check it out. You engage behind Jesus. He's already gone before you. Okay, so you're not fighting alone. We don't fight this battle alone, but it's important that you do fight. It's important that we fight and we know how to fight, who to fight, what to fight. So we're kind of, we're going through that. And this is our theme verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you guys. It says this, for though we live in the world, we're here. I mean, I get it. We live in this world and you do have to eat and make a living and, and make a family. And, and, and there's a lot of stuff with this world. There's a lot of pleasures in the world. God doesn't have anything against you having pleasure in life. Have pleasure. That's fine. We're living in the world, but be careful. Don't wage, the, don't wage war like the world does. All right? There is a warfare going on, and there's a specific strategy that God has given us to engage in the war. So the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. And so the weapons, and we'll go there at the end of this message or towards the last half of this message, the weapons that God has given us, we're finding out, is the armor of God. And every piece of the armor is important. It's integral. It, it, it helps us. Every piece is essential to fighting the enemy and overcoming victoriously, you guys. So what we've done, actually, we extended this series two weeks, two extra weeks, because we just felt that it was so important to, to dig into each piece of this armor and really explain to you how you need to be able to, how you need to put it on and use it to assure your victory. Amen. So we're actually going a couple more weeks, you guys. We're supposed to end today, but we're extending it because, man, you need to know the weapons that God is giving you. These weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish that word there, strongholds that we've been talking about. In the Greek there, it means just that we've bought into a lie. It means living your life based on something that is not true. A lie. That's what the enemy uses. That's, his, that's the strongholds that he uses is lies and, and deception. Okay, and so here's, the, I was actually doing some research about um, military tactics, thinking about, you know, war and the war that we're in. There's this sixth century Chinese general uh, named Sun Tzu, and he actually wrote The Art of War. Some of you guys probably heard of The Art of War. It, it has been used in military warfare uh, every generation, like still use his, his mind on military tactics. It's actually not just using military warfare, our modern military warfare, but, but some of these, these strategies and, and principles that he writes in this book called the art of war are used in business. They're used in leadership. It's used in sports. It's used all, all over, but what he writes about the tactics of military warfare can actually give us a good insight in the, this idea of spiritual warfare as well. Let me read you a little excerpt of The Art of War, written by this Chinese general. He says, all warfare is based on deception. All right. All warfare, he says, is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, 
we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we're far away. And when we're far away, we must make him believe we're near. See, like, likewise, this spiritual warfare that Satan wages against us is also based on deception. You cannot always gauge it based on what you see, based on what you feel, because you might not be seeing anything, but he may be scheming uh, just around the corner, okay? And, and I really think, like, parents, if, you, if you're a parent and you have children, you, you probably are more familiar with the military tactics of deceit more than anybody else, okay? I mean, your parents know what I'm talking about because kids are, kids are schemers, man. They're, they're deceitful schemers. <laughs> so, so when my wife and I just recently, we were talking and stuff, and she, she was like, oh, there's, 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 be quiet. And I'm like, what? What's going on? She said, do you hear that? No. She said, exactly. Where are the kids? You know, so it's like they, they, they know. They're just, or when they're, when they're like acting really nice and they're, they're try, like, what are you up to? Something's going on here behind the scene. You're trying to. So it's, so anyway, we're talking about the deceit, all right, of the enemy and this military tactic that really he's a master technician. And he, he, I believe he's operating in culture, in our life, around our life more than we know more than we realize. And because we're not fighting the warfare on the, on the right way with the right weapons, we, we kind of unknowingly buy into his deception. Unknowingly, I think. Obviously, it's unknowingly because it's a deception. So we're kind of exposing those things. So here's the one we're going to expose today. Here's a lie of the enemy. Part three, a beautiful deception is this. Write it down. He'll try to tell you and convince you, you can never win. You can never win. This is one of Satan's greatest tactics to imprison you in doubt, a place of doubt and disbelief where you, keeping you from trusting in God and trusting in his power, even in trusting in your own abilities and what, in your own power that God has, has given you. If he can get you to believe you can't, you can't be healed. You can't be free. You, you, you can't be happy. You can't make it through. If he can get you to believe that, that you can't lead, that you can't influence, that you can't add value, then he can keep you trapped in a web of deceit and prevent you from accomplishing God's plan for your life. And, what, and, and we, again, it's unknowingly that he does this. And this tactic is so, it's so deceiving because this one here, when we buy into this, it, it, it gets us to not even fight at all, does it? When we buy into this, that I can never win, I can't. It, check this out. Listen, the enemy isn't even out there anymore. Oh no, he's not. You're not. I'm not fighting against the enemy. I'm not even fighting against flesh and blood out here. You know where the enemy is now? He's convinced us the enemy is right here. I can't. What's what's the use? Why do, why even suit up? Why even engage? Why 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 even try? Because I can't. This tactic is so deceitful because he gets you to fight against yourself. And some of us, we bought into some lies of the enemy that you can't lies in different areas of our life. And what he's done, he successfully and unknowingly got some of us to lower the standard of our life. Instead of believing God for great things, and, and maybe we started out with great things and miracles, and I can, but over life and circumstances and trial, you bought into, maybe in an area of your life, maybe it's you've just kind of lowered the standard of your future, lowered the standard of your marriage, lowered the standard of, and you bought into the lie that you, that you can't, that you can't win. And we're imprisoned by it. We're in prison by can't. And let me, let me give you, I don't know what, you know, what maybe you, know, you have bought into possibly in different areas of your life that you've limited God, you've lowered the standard. But let me just expose four of these areas of lies that the enemy will come in and try to tell you, you can't. Write them down. Here's the first one, because he'll come at you and he'll try to convince you, you can't have healthy relationships. Do you want to ever feel that or sense that or the enemy? How, does, does any of this sound familiar I'm toxic. Any of those like thoughts like I'm damaged goods. I hurt everyone. I destroy everything. Or how about this one? I don't deserve someone. I don't deserve somebody good. Where the enemy just convinced us to lower the standard that I can't, I can't have a healthy 
relationship. And this one, the reason why the enemy wants to convince you of this one, because he knows you were created for community. You were created to, to, to do life and experience life in community with a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And so much, you guys, our ultimate destiny in life has a lot to do with who we choose to be connected to. Do you realize that? So the enemy wants you connected to the wrong people for the wrong reasons. And just like being connected to the right people can inspire us to greatness, being intimately connected to the wrong person can bring personal destruction. The people you choose to be connected to can either propel you towards your destiny or it can hold us captive by reminding us of our messed up history. They can either encourage us to fulfill our God-given destiny or or those people can discourage us, putting us down in a pool of like self-pity. I heard someone say, it's hard to soar like an eagle when you're hanging around with turkeys. Okay? Some of you guys need it. Some of you guys are hanging around too many turkeys. So we've convinced ourselves that I can't have healthy relationships. So the relationships I do gravitate to, the people I am attracted to are the wrong people. I don't, I don't even feel comfortable around healthy people because I can't handle healthy. I'm unhealthy. I am the problem. I'm unhealthy, so I'm just going to gravitate towards, even be attracted to relationships that are destructive in nature to me. Could it be, is that, could that be the reason why maybe some of you here today have dysfunctional relationships? That, that you're attracted to friends that, that pull you down and, and hurt you, or even people in relationships that hurt you. Could it be that you bought into the lie that you're not good enough for a healthy relationship? One of the um, best examples of this in scripture, or the, the most dysfunctional like relationship, the poster child for dysfunctional relationship was Samson, right? Samson and Delilah. Samson's a Nazarite, and he's got this power of God that was connected to the vow that he made to God. And he falls for this uh, Philistine woman named Delilah, who constantly burns him and constantly hurts him. And he's still like, like, drawn to this dysfunctional relationship. Check it out in Judges chapter 16. Delilah said to Samson, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? And he, that's trouble, man. When, when someone comes to you and goes, you love me if, you better be careful what comes after, after that. This is trouble. This is the third time you've made a fool of me. This is time, the third time now she's tried to deceive Samson and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. So she was trying to get the secret of his strength so she can tell his enemies so that he could be defeated. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until, and this is what, this is what some of, a lot of you feel, he was sick to death of it. And that's what these dysfunctional relationships and hurtful relationships have done. And some of you are in these, these relationships that just make you sick to death. But there's something about them. There's something about it that keeps drawing you to and it's sucking to you to people that hurt you or abuse you. Could it be the enemies convinced us? We bought into a lie that we can't have healthy relationships. Here's another kind of area the enemy will, will tell you you can't. He'll try to tell you you can't break destructive cycles. Anyone ever heard that one from the enemy? Maybe receive, you, you can't break this destruction. No, no, this is, this is gone on from generation to generation. Your, your mama had this, your grandma had this. This is who you are. You can't break this addiction. You can't break this anger thing. That's just, that's just who you are. You can't break the cycle of lying. You can't break the cycle of poverty. No, 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 that's, just, that's a part of, of who you are and who you belong to. The children of Israel... Um, about a month after being delivered from Egypt, were beginning to feel differently about their circumstances. They witnessed the hand of God, the miracle of God, miracle after a miracle in Egypt when they were slaves by taskmasters and by the Egyptians, culminating in the parting of the Red Sea. So they've seen all these miracles, but just a month after all these miracles, all this excitement and gratitude started to wear off. And this cycle that they, of slavery and poverty that they found themselves in was calling them back and pulling them back. Look what it says in Numbers chapter 11. They said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt. Look at this, at no cost. Excuse me? You were slaves, all right? You were, what do you mean at, at no cost, okay? Also, the, look at this, the cucumbers, the melons, and when have you ever craved a leak in your life? Are you kidding me? The leaks? <laughs> and look, because w- what happens is we start looking back with rose-colored glasses, don't we? And we magnify and glorify the provision and we minimize the price. 
And that cycle of, of, of patterns of uh, destructive cycles are calling us back. And come on, the onions, the garlic, are you kidding me? Come on. How about the slavery? How about that? You remember that? You remember, the sla- you remember when that almost took your marriage? Do you remember when it took your peace and your joy and your job? And do you remember what that, the price was that you were delivered from? He goes on, but now they say we lost our appetite. We're not, even, we're not even hungry for this anymore. We're, we're craving. We never see anything but this heavenly manna, they say. Man, just this, hannum, this, this manna. This is, we laugh at it, but this is a perfect picture of how we look when we buy into the deception, you guys. When we buy into the deception of the enemy, looking back with rose-colored glasses. Maybe the enemy has lied to you and tried to tell you this one. Here's the third one, that you can't survive this storm. He'll tell you you can't. He wants you to buy in. You can't. And I put this storm on purpose because I know and I recognize that there, there are some storms that you're in probably today. I don't know what this storm is for you today, but the enemy would love for you to believe that you can't survive this storm, that you can't survive this sickness, that you can't survive this divorce, this separation. You can't survive this loss. And, and he'll want to lower your standard of living. In Mark chapter 4, um, Verse 38, the disciples are on the, the sea and the waves are beating against their, their boat and there's this a crazy torrent of, of wind and waves and they're afraid. And it says Jesus was in the cern sleeping on a cushion and the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, here it goes. They bought into the deception. Teacher, you don't even care if we die. You don't even, God, do you even care? Do you see what's, What's happening? Do you see my life? Do you see the problems I'm in? Do you see the storm? And the devil would love for you to give up, to give in or surrender to the destruction. He's a master manipulator, and he will have you believing that not even God could get you through. Or maybe that God can, but he must not want to because it's just getting darker and the waves are getting bigger, and he wants you to believe in the middle of that that you can't handle this. This is going to take you out. That you're going you're gonna to drown. It's a lie of the enemy. He wants you to just lower your standard, to buy into the lie. Here's the fourth one. You can't, he'll try to tell you, you can't ever be enough. Have you ever experienced that or felt that, where you just felt unqualified? Maybe even after, a lot of times it'll happen after a great experience. After you heard from God, you had a message, you had a revelation, you had a touch, or maybe you did something meaningful. Right after that experience, I have found that we just come to this place where it's like, oh my gosh, I could, who am I though? Who am I? I mean, I can't ever be enough. I'm unqualified, I'm disqualified, or maybe we're playing the comparison game. When God called Moses to deliver his people out of slavery in Egypt. He had a, Moses had a list of things that he felt disqualified him. A list of things that he said, I'm not enough. How can I be the deliverer? How can I be used by you for anything great when I have, have this resume? God, I, can't, I can never be enough. Exodus chapter 4, verse 13, after God tells Moses, this is the plan, you know, it's you. Here it is. You're the deliverer. Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else, anyone, God, because I'm not enough. I just, I, I can't ever be enough. Can I tell you something? Listen, God's love and calling has nothing to do with your perfection. Can you receive that? Okay. Has nothing to do with your performance. His calling and his love in your life has nothing to do with you and your, your performance and perfection at all. And as long as your identity rests in your abilities, you will always be insecure in life. Do you know that? Okay, because when, when your identity rests in what you can do, you'll always be insecure because when you'll never, you're never going to get it right all the time. Sometimes you're going to do good. Sometimes you'll make the right decision. Sometimes you won't. And in the moments that you won't, you're going to beat yourself up. You're going to be insecure. In the moments that you did do it, you're going to give yourself the glory. All right? So, because we like to measure ourselves by ourselves, and you're always going to end up short when you do that. Listen, stop measuring yourself by yourself and start measuring yourself by the God who is in you. See, the key here for Moses was that God said, I will be with you when you go. It wasn't that he was strong enough, called enough, gifted enough, perfect enough. It was God said, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. That's what we put our hope in and our strength in. Here's the reality, you guys. We aren't enough without God. 
but with God, all things are possible to him who believes. The enemy want to try, he'll try to convince you that you can't, but that's why Paul says, hey, put on the full armor of God. When the enemy tries to convince you that you can't, and I don't know what areas of life that you've lowered your standard of living, you've lowered your standard, maybe of your future, of your destiny, of God's call, of his promises, what we need to do is put, is put on the full armor of God. Let's go there again. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies. And that word there, it means schemes, tactics, plans. That's what that word, the enemy is at the drawing board trying to trip you up, steal, kill, and destroy. We got to put on the armor of God. We're in a battle. We're in a fight. We got to suit up for war to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. And he says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're not fighting against, against, and some of you need to listen to this, please. Some of you aren't, you're not fighting against the enemy. You're not fighting against, against people even, but your battle, your real battle for some of you is a fight against yourself. Some of you, some of you, the enemy has convinced you that you're the problem and you bought in somewhere in your life that you can't, that you're not enough, that you'll never be. And you've lowered, you've lowered your standards in certain areas away from God's word, his promises, and what he says. And you've bought into a false reality. You've bought, there's a stronghold in your life because you believed a lie. You're fighting against yourself. Can I tell you something? You're not your enemy. You're not your enemy. That's not your, your enemy is not against flesh and blood. But it's against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against the mighty powers in this dark world and against the evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy. That's why we put on the armor, to resist. You see, putting on the armor does not remove you from battle. It just it enables you to resist the enemy in the battle. All right, so don't, don't, don't be deceived, okay? Just because you put on the armor of God doesn't, doesn't negate the attack. It doesn't negate war from happening. No, no, no. It doesn't remove you from the battlefield. It just allows you to resist the enemy because the battle's coming. The battle's coming. In the time of evil is coming. It's coming. Then after the battle, though, you'll be able to stand firm. So what do we do, you guys? What do we do when the enemy tries to convince us that, that you can't? That we can. Well, what, what we need to do, the piece of the armor is we need to take up the shield of faith. When the enemy says you can't and tries to tell you what you can't do, what we need to do is raise up faith in that moment against the enemy. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 16, as it continues this armor and we're continuing with it. He says, in addition to all these other pieces we've talked about, take up the shield of faith, which with you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And I love this picture. Just the, the paint, the, Paul, I love it. He's painting this picture of armor, but then he also paints this picture of these arrows that the enemy is, is, is like shooting at us. And, and I love the picture because that's what the enemy is like. These, these arrows are like thoughts from the enemy battlefield of our mind where he says, you can't ever be healthy. You can't win. You can't survive this storm. And he's just shooting these fiery arrows at us in the form of thoughts that you can't be good enough. You can't, you can't, you can't. But instead of believing every thought that you think, listen, you, you don't need to let every thought take root into your life. Some thoughts need to be taken captive. Some thoughts need to be, be, be brought into the obedience of Christ. Some thoughts need to be demolished. Amen. And some thoughts need to be, need to be extinguished by the shield of faith. You don't believe every thought that comes into your mind. Don't let every thought take root in your life. Um, you need to lift up faith against some of these thoughts. Lift up a standard against some of these thoughts. A couple days ago, uh, Veronica, she had a, a bad dream, and the enemy was coming at her in the area of her thoughts. I don't know if you've ever experienced a bad dream or, or, or maybe in the area of your thoughts or the enemy is just working on, on your mind, and she was explaining to me this, this dream, and it was horrible. It was It was bad. And so I, after she's explained, I said, honey, take my hands. 
we're going to pray because that is a lie of the enemy. Ain't none of that true. That is not God's plan. That is not God's. And I, and, and I took her hands and I started casting down, rebuking and extinguishing the flames of those arrows coming against my wife. And I said, from as we move out of this bed, we're not moving with those thoughts. We are moving with joy. We're taking up joy. We're taking up faith. We're taking up peace because that's your plan for us, God. And we squashed it right there. How many times have you let, listen, have you let a thought take root where you didn't grab hold of it, where you didn't extinguish it by the shield of faith and it affected how you treated people? It affected how you you encountered your day in life. How many times has that happened? How many times have you had a dream or a thought that your husband or your spouse was cheating on you, (laughs) right? And you treat them different all day. Don't come on, don't it? It happens to all of us. All day you treat them different, all right? You had a dream, you wake up and, and... and he says, hey, honey, good morning. Is it good? Is it? Is it? All right? And you just start. To, and all of it was just because of the root of a thought that you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't extinguish with your shield of faith. You go to work and you're treating people differently. You're just encountering life differently because those thoughts have taken root. You didn't lift. You, didn't, you weren't ready for battle. We need to take up the shield of faith. And when we do, when we lift up the shield of faith, when the enemy is trying to tell us that what we can't do Four things are going to happen. Write these down. Four, four things are going to happen when we take up the shield of faith. Number one, my faith gives me sight. You see, even in the middle of the storm, when you take up the shield of faith, you'll see God in the midst of the storm. You'll, see, you'll be strengthened in the middle of it. There's this great story in 2 Kings chapter 6 where Elisha was surrounded by a Syrian army. And Elisha's servant, was he, he, got, uh, he got caught up in what I call first sight. You know what first sight is? First sight is, is the initial reaction of the moment. It's the initial reaction of that experience. It's what you see, what you think, and what you feel immediately in that moment. And many of us get caught up right there at first sight, and we let it bring fear and confusion and frustration, and we never, let, we never lift up a shield of faith to see from a different perspective. And so here's Alicia's servant. And he's caught up in first sight, and he wakes up with, with Alicia, and he sees the Syrian army surrounding them, and he's filled with those things, fear, confusion, frustration. And Elisha prays this prayer. He says, open the eyes, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened his servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There was this angelic army surrounding. Can I tell you something? God's army is bigger than the army against you. All right, and when you, when you have faith, God, you'll see God's presence is greater, that your faith declares you serve a God who makes roads in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, a God who makes a way when there seems to be no way, a God who parts the Red Sea. He held back the waters of the Jordan. He makes a way for you by faith in Jesus' name. That's what happens when we lift up faith. It gives us a different perspective perspective. You need to get in his presence today and pick up this. Stop believing in what you're seeing and let faith give you a new perspective. Can I tell you something though? Jesus gives us 100% certainty, but he doesn't always give us 100% clarity, right? Isn't that true? It is. It's not always 100% clear, but just because it's not clear doesn't mean you don't have to be, you can't be certain. All right. You, you, Ephesians, Chapter 1, verse 18 talks about this, that you're not always going to see with the eyes of your head, but God wants to reveal to you through the eyes of your heart. Look at this. Ephesians 1, 18 says, and I pray that the eyes of your heart, don't get caught up in first sight. Don't get, don't get, don't stop at first sight and be filled with fear and confusion and doubt and disbelief because God wants to open the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, that it may be enlightened, flooded with with light by the Holy Spirit so that you will know and cherish the hope that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened and open, the divine guarantee and the confident expectation. See, your expe- you can't have confidence when you, when you can get caught up in first sight in your eyes. God wants to show you in the spirit. He wants to open the eyes of your heart to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, God's people, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Take up the shield of faith. It gives you sight. And it takes faith. It takes faith to, faith to see your victory before the battle. And you can, see, you can see your victory before you even go to battle when you're, when you're taking up the shield of faith. Here's the second thing that it does. 
My faith unlocks God's promises. My faith unlocks God's promises. There are, there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible that are all for you. Faith is the key that unlocks every promise of God. You need to know the promises of God. And not only that, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, we talked about this on worship night. Anyone come to worship night? Who came to worship night? Powerful move of God. You guys, I'm telling you, the Lord did something this last worship night, this last Wednesday. Really, I think, uh, ushered Discovery Church, us as a church, into a different dimension. We went to a whole nother level. There was a prophetic anointing over the night. And I spoke about this verse right here, that no matter how many promises God has made, they are what? They are yes in Christ. Yes and amen. You have access to every promise of God. There are promises for your faith, promises for your life, promises for your future, your destiny, your calling, your marriage, your kids. There are so many promises of God that are yes and amen in Christ. They are yours in Christ. There are certain personal promises that God has made you specifically and personally that are yes and amen in Christ. At worship night, it was so beautiful. We, we actually had um, people step out and really say yes and amen to a few things. A, a group of people stepped out and said, I feel called to ministry. I feel called to, 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 to be a, a, a minister of the gospel. And we had a bunch of people step out, and a lot of people stepped out for other things that God was calling them to. It was beautiful. It really was. But can I, if you were here at worship night and you stepped out, or maybe you're here and and you have said yes and amen to something, or you want to say, okay, yes and amen to that promise, God. Can I tell you something? You, you, you can't just declare the promises of God. You have to give birth to the promises of God. All right? You can't just pluck that verse out of the Bible and say, I declare. No, 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 no. You got you to gotta carry that promise full term into fruition. You want to know why so many of us aren't, aren't walking in and experiencing the blessings of the promises of God? Because we're aborting them before their full term. We, we're not carrying the promise into fruition. We want to just declare it out there. No, no, no. Don't just declare it. Carry. Give birth to the promises of God. Amen? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3 says, The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and do what? And what? Protect you from the evil ones. That's the, the, the shield is a defensive mechanism. There was some offensive, I'm not going to get into it. I don't have time to get into the offensive nature of it. But it is the primary and the first layer of defense and protection against the enemy. Here's number three. My faith gives me power to hold on. My faith, and some of you need this today. Some of you, you're ready to give up. You're ready to throw in the towel, and the enemies convince you that you're, you can't survive this. You can't, you can't do it. You can't make it. And you need faith. You need to take up the shield of faith to hold on. The faith to step out, church, is meaningless without the faith to stick it out. Are you hearing me today? Come on, church. Some of you, got, some of you have the faith to start it, but you need, you, you need the faith to stick it out, to hold on. Anytime there's a great move of God, I'm telling you, the devil will be there to try to hinder it. The greater the move of God, the greater the, the hindrance from the enemy. Isaiah 59, 19 says, the enemy, when the enemy comes in like a flood. And that word picture, he's not just talking about a little, a little attack. I mean, he's talking about this torrent, right? A flood where it feels like I'm drowning. It feels like he's coming at me from every angle. He says, when the enemy comes at you like that and is lying to you and is trying to deceive you and tell you you can't, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. When the enemy tries to get you to lower your standard of living, lower the standard of your future and your calling, lower the standard of your relationships, the spirit of God in the moment of trial says, no, 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 I'm going to lift the standard up in your life. I am your defender. Somebody say amen. amen. Faith gives me the power to hold on. And faith isn't an island either. You guys, you can't, a lot of times in life, you're not, we're not strong enough alone to fight the battle. The shield, the, sh the Roman shield was made very uniquely. It wasn't, it was made to actually link up with the other soldiers in the army to create what they call a tortoise formation. You guys may have seen it in the movies. You ever watched 300? 
You ever see Hunter where they make that big dome thing is where people in the front and the side and the back, they all put their shields up and make this big dome. There was a scene where the arrows blotted out the sun and it was prevented from hitting anyone by this, the protection of brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, you, you may have faith, okay, but you have blind spots. Your shield doesn't protect from every side. There's blind spots, and the enemy is scheming against your blind spots. He's playing to your, to your strengths and weaknesses. And there are times in your life where you need someone to grab your hands like I did to my wife, where there's times where you need to be a shield for somebody else, where you need to lift up a shield and say, honey, you get up under this. I'm going to lift up a standard for you. I'm going I'm to declare faith for you. You need someone to encourage you when you're weak and strengthen you when you're doubting. Sometimes you need to be that for somebody else because you were meant to do it alone. Your faith alone cannot withstand the attack of the enemy. The shield of faith was created to link up with brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why we're so huge on small groups here at Discovery that you need to do life in community together because your faith alone, I'm telling you, you were not created to win alone. You weren't. Your enemy is, is stronger than you think. You, you alone, no, you can't do it. You're created to do life together and to link your shield. That's why it's so important who you're linking your shields up with, church. Get into a group, get into a faith-filled community and do life together. Here's the fourth one. My faith moves mountains. My faith can move mountains, church. This is what Jesus says, Matthew 17. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. See, whatever you're facing today, maybe you need a miracle. Maybe God's asking you to take on a mountain. Maybe it's a new career. Maybe, maybe he's asking you to forgive someone. Maybe he's asking you to, to let go of something or let go of someone or step into a calling. Whatever that mountain might be, God is asking you to have faith. What are you going to do in this moment? Are you going to give up? Are you going to give in? Are you going to run away? Are you going to take up the shield of faith? God is calling you to trust him, not in your ability, not in your strength, not in your own intellect, but trust in him. Put your faith in God today. Maybe you've been assigned a mountain and you're wondering, what is this? Why, why is this mountain in my life? Maybe you've been assigned that mountain so that people can see that mountains can be moved. Faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable, and receives the impossible. Let me say that again. Faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable, and receives the impossible. Let me say it this way. Faith, it's faith, you guys, that gives us the power to overcome the enemy. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it's not in your notes. You may want to write it down. He says, this is how we overcome the evil one, even by our faith. It's your faith that overcomes. It's the shield of faith. 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Let me close with this. The Apostle Paul says, hey, we're, we're hard pressed on every side. You're not alone. You're not alone. Man. You're, not al you're not just the only one the enemy's scheming on, trying to lie to. You're not the only one that's, that's pressed on every side, but check this out. We're not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Hey, take up the shield of faith today. Amen.